center of Menu is the home of the permanent exhibition and archive of the global icon, Nelson Politsasa Mandela. applause and welcome to the chair of the Nelson Mandela Foundation Board of Trustees, Professor Njabule Ndebele. Another warm round of applause and welcome for Mama Grasa Machel. And finally, a thunderous and warm South African welcome and applause 
for the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture Speaker, Malala Yousafzai. Honorable Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture, Zizi Godwa, Gauteng Premier, Mr. Panyaza Lusufi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Nelson Mandela Foundation Board of Trustees, the acting CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Vern Harris, ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. My name is Nigiwe Bigicha and we're so delighted that you could join us today. It is so wonderful to be back at the Nelson Mandela Theater, which was the venue of the inaugural annual lecture in 2003 delivered by former U.S. President Bill Clinton. Since then, ladies and gentlemen, the annual lecture has grown from strength to strength as a sought-after platform for thought leadership, reflection, and debate on significant social issues. The Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture has been held around the country and more recently beyond our borders in New York and The Hague further cementing Madiba's legacy as a man of the people and a global icon. We are therefore so delighted this year and honored that activist and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Malala Yousafzai accepted our invitation to be the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture Speaker here in Johannesburg, where it all began. This year's lecture sees a different format from what we've seen in the past. After delivering her remarks, our speaker this year will lead and moderate a discussion with an esteemed panel which will delve deeper into some of the issues that she will raise. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today, of course, is a significant date on our calendar significant and poignant, as it marks 10 years since we lost our founder, Madiba, on the 5th of December in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to now ask all of us to rise as we observe a moment's silence in his memory. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I'm sure you'll agree with me then. It is therefore fitting, as we mark the 10th anniversary since Madiba's passing, that we take a hard look at ourselves and the state of the world we live in. It is a moment of polycrises and conflicts and begs for us all to revive the values of Madiba who lived a life in pursuit of justice, freedom, equality, and peace. As many of you will agree, we are far from that place. So the theme for this year's Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture is leading for a just future. To further elucidate on that theme and to introduce this year's speaker, Please welcome the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Njabulo Ndebele. Good afternoon to 
everyone uh, in the hall and uh, beyond here in the theater, our aud television audiences around uh, the country. And I welcome you on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and uh, delighted that we are back in this theater as you heard where the first uh, lecture was given by uh, President uh, uh, Bill Clinton. Now, uh, so that is a history worth retelling uh, today. And uh, many who have attended previous lectures will recall following the pictorial history of uh, our speakers on Yoma, we'd have some walls, on the walls, all these pictures that tell the story of their sequencing. And you would have all gone all the way up from the beginning to the end to our latest speaker, and we'll have confirmed by the largest margin that she was definitely not among the oldest of them. So Malala, we are honored uh, to welcome you to this precious piece of South Africa uh, this afternoon. And we welcome your father and your husband who are traveling with you. And Mrs. Michelle and members of the Mandiba family, we always appreciate year after year the sense of continuity your presence brings to the ambience and character of Madiba's lecture. I welcome you once more. Thank you. And finally, allow me to welcome a fellow board of trustees, members of the, of the foundation, whose uh, reward for serving Madiba's foundation is only the satisfaction they derive from the selfless giving of their intellects, their integrity, their sensibilities, dedication, energy, and time to being a vital part of keeping alive and honoring Madiba's legacy. That legacy continues to inspire the global imagination and shape the hopes of people, billions around the world. We are truly grateful to your contributions. For each lecture, we invite globally influential figures to address the critical issues facing our world. We endeavor through the lecture to promote dialogue on those issues, keeping them alive in the public imagination and through the sense of urgency that's generated at each time, inspire action for lasting impact. Madiba's commitment to social justice, equity, robust reconciliation, and human rights are the load stars that give direction to all the work that we do. This year, we commemorate, as you have heard, 10 years of uh, Madiba's passing. And after a decade with him, we confess to continue to miss him dearly. We miss his astute and profound leadership. We miss how deeply he loved all the people of South Africa and touched so many around the world. And we miss the promise and symbol of freedom and unity that he represented. And above all, we miss how whenever we listened to him, we took in which he gave to us the voice of conviction 
of genuineness, of honesty, of credibility, and immense integrity. His words and voice always conveyed the depth of honesty and the real sense of the truth behind it. Madiba spoke to engage our understanding. I think this was because of his attitude towards language. He once said about language, and I quote, without language, one cannot talk to people and understand them. One cannot share their hopes and aspirations, grasp their history, appreciate their poetry, and savor their songs, end of quote. Language was then for Madiba a living social tool for building community. For these reasons, he took care to learn the language, took care to speak it well, and to hear it spoken by others he listened to when they spoke back at him. And so he would want to speak, we would want to hear. Speaking to him never came across as a calculated trade-off such as, give me this and I will give you that. He spoke to people because interaction with them through language was always an opportunity for mutual discovery for building and expanding community. That is why language and language spoken well were very important to him. We can encapsulate the significance of every speech moment for him. What you say is who you are. How you say it is who you are. And how you are heard to be saying what you say is who you are. Today, our world sees many leaders who stand on global stages where the entire world is looking and listening to them. We, we, be it in the United Nations, in parliament, in political rallies, as they speak, you can tell that many do not believe any of the words they utter. They cannot be trusted on the understandings and undertakings and assurances they promise. And you can tell also that their listeners do not believe a word of what they are saying. But in the manner of the trade, they plod on performing conviction which is reflected neither in their words, nor in their faces, nor in the visible language of the bodies when they speak. And this is how, if you look carefully around, powerful doubts, suspicion, mistrust, animosity is spread throughout our nations, throughout our countries, and around the world. And everywhere one goes, not only in South Africa, but also around the world, and for a variety of reasons, there is a deep anxiety over the future of the world. The international rule of law is particularly under attack. Global governance institutions, such as the United Nations, are routinely undermined by powerful nations who willfully ignore and undermine international law because they can. Or in individual countries, powerful leaders flout the rule of law because they can. Such are the concerns that led us to the theme of today's lecture, leading for a just future. To help us ponder this theme, is Malala Yousafzai, our speaker for the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Malala is a Pakistani female education activist and 
the 2014 Nobel Peace Prize laureate at the age of 17. <laughs> and by far the world's youngest Nobel Prize laureate and the second Pakistani and the first Pashtun to receive a Nobel Prize. She's a human rights advocate for the education of women and children in her native land. Swat is, the, is where she comes from, where girls were at times banned attending school. I cannot, I, I'm, I'm compelled to remember at this moment as I mentioned her contributions and advocacy on behalf of children and, and young women to urge us to remember at this very moment the children of Palestine. <laughs> Her advocacy has grown into an international movement and according to former Prime Minister Shahid Abbasi, she has become Pakistan's most prominent citizen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Malala to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Distinguished guests, Professor Andy Bailey and the Nelson Mandela Foundation team, it is an honor to be here. This is my first visit to South Africa, and you have made it very special. Grasa Mashal. Grasa Mashal, it is a particular honor to be with you. Thank you for fighting for girls and women everywhere and for always championing the voices of young people. Thank you to everyone here with me today and all those listening online from around the world. And thank you to the activists and experts who will be joining us in conversation after my speech. I know I'm here to give a lecture, but you all know me. I will always be a student first. It is as students that we first open our eyes to injustice. It is as students that we first ask difficult questions about the world. It is as students that we first find friends who embolden us to speak out. So when I thought about what I want to share with you today, and what it means to lead for a just future, I approached this assignment not as a lecturer, but as a student. With Mandela's legacy in mind, I asked myself, what injustice is the world overlooking? Where are we allowing inhumanity to become the status quo? The answer for me, was very clear and very personal. The oppression of girls and women in Afghanistan. My family and I know what it feels like to live under the Taliban ideology. At 11, I was banned from school. At 15, I was shot and nearly killed for standing up for my right to receive an education. We were always looking over our shoulders. Nelson Mandela and his fellows, South Africans, knew that feeling well. And their resilience and collective action in the face of injustice can inspire us. 
Just two years ago, women in Afghanistan were working, serving in leadership positions, running ministries, traveling freely. Girls of all ages were playing soccer and cricket and learning in schools. Though all was not perfect, there was progress. And fundamentally, girls and women had opportunities. They had choice. They had agency. Then the Taliban seized power a second time. As they did in the 1990s, they quickly began the systematic oppression of girls and women. For a short time, this made headlines. But since then, the world has turned its back on the Afghan people. Maybe this reflects the sheer number of crises the world is facing. Violence and displacement in Sudan, famine in Yemen, the climate crisis being debated right now at COP28, war in Ukraine, and of course, the unjust bombardment of Gaza, where a child is killed every 10 minutes. So much of humanity is wounded. But we cannot allow ourselves to buy into this false notion that we can only care about one crisis at a time. We must be able to hold space for suffering wherever it is happening in the world. So today, I would like to bring attention back to the girls of Afghanistan whose suffering has been sidelined. Our first imperative is to call the regime in Afghanistan what it really is. It is a gender apartheid. We know that gender-based discrimination exists in every country. Gender-based persecution exists in many countries. But gender apartheid is different. Apartheid is a system that is, imposed, that is imposed and enforced by those in power. The very people who are supposed to protect their citizens. In South Africa, defenders of such a system insisted that it was somehow the natural order of things to segregate whites from non-whites. Similarly, in Afghanistan, the Taliban say that oppressing girls and women is a matter of religion. So let me say this as plainly as possible. That is only an excuse, but it is also not true. Many Muslim scholars, including from Afghanistan, have made clear that Islam does not condone denying girls and women their right to education and to work. But the Taliban are not interested in the truth. They are interested in maintaining power. And they will use any excuse from culture to security to justify their actions. In the name of their false vision, they have introduced more than 80 decrees and edicts restricting girls' and women's rights. If you are a girl in Afghanistan, the Taliban has decided your future for you. You cannot attend a secondary school or university. You cannot find an open library where you can read. You see your mothers and your older sisters confined and constrained in a similar way. They cannot leave the house on their own, not to work, not to go to the park, not to get a haircut, not to even see a doctor. And the punishment for doing these very ordinary everyday things is severe. Indefinite detention, forced marriage, beating, death. In effect, the Taliban have made girlhood illegal. And it is taking a toll. Girls kept out of school are experiencing depression and anxiety. Some 
are turning to narcotics, attempting suicide. No girl anywhere in the world should have to suffer this way. If we, as a global community, accept the Taliban's edicts, we are sending a devastating message to girls everywhere that they are less human, that your rights are up for debate, that we are willing to look away. There is another reason to call this gender apartheid. Apartheid is more than just a description. It is a legal concept. South Africans fought for racial apartheid to be recognized and criminalized at the international level. In the process, they drew more of the world's attentions to the, world, to the horrors of apartheid. More people joined the anti-apartheid campaign driving political and cultural change. By defining systemic oppression in legal terms, they named it and made it easier to enlist allies against it. But gender apartheid has not been explicitly codified yet. That is why I call on every government in every country to make gender apartheid a crime against humanity. We have an opportunity to do that right now. The UN is currently drafting and debating a new Crimes Against Humanity Treaty. This is the moment for world leaders to stand with Afghan girls and women. Adding and adapting language on gender apartheid to the treaty will codify it under the international law. Member states like South Africa can play an important role in championing this cause. This legal approach might seem disconnected from everyday lives and human suffering. But the international law is not an abstraction. It is a practical tool. It is a way to protect the oppressed. It is a way to hold the Taliban to account and to hold anyone who helps them legally complicit. And as we saw with South Africa, it can spur and strengthen collective action. In these ways, codification will help prevent gender apartheid from happening elsewhere. It will send a strong message of support to the girls and women of Afghanistan who have been demanding this, that we hear them, that we will not let them fight alone. I want you to know about Hanifa, a 16-year-old girl from northern Afghanistan. When the Taliban pushed girls out of secondary school, Hanifa was stuck at home, feeling like the walls were closing in. She took matters into her own hands, gathered her friends and their sisters in her living room to teach them English and maths in secret. I want you to know about Zarka Yaftali, a researcher and human rights advocate. Three years ago, Zarka warned the UN that if the Taliban returned, girls' and women's rights would be crushed. Zarka's worst fear were confirmed, and she was forced into exile. But she is not giving up. She is helping build the case for codifying gender apartheid. It is time for all of us to stand with her. Hanifa and Zarka are two of many Afghans rising up, as Madiba did, against injustice. But they cannot do this alone, nor should they have to. As we press to make gender apartheid a crime against humanity, there's more we can do now. First, international actors must resist normalizing relations with the Taliban. This includes governments, conference organizers, and UN officials engaging with the Taliban as if they were just another partner. This also means companies seeking to make business deals with them. 
those who prioritize political or financial gains over human rights are condoning, are condoning gender apartheid. If we want to send a clear signal that the world stands against apartheid, we cannot allow any cracks in our resolve. This is important because despite appearances, the Taliban are not immune to international pressure. Last spring, they unjustly detained Matiullah Vesa, a champion for girls' education. But activists in Afghanistan and around the world rallied for his case, and eventually he was released. If it weren't for the international pressure, we may never have seen him again. Second, we must find and create ways to bring education to Afghan girls at home. Afghan organizations and international partners are already piloting digital learning platforms, science and maths lessons on TV and radio, and interactive lectures via SMS and social media. We need philanthropists and institutions to fund these innovations, which is the only way that Afghan girls are going to learn while they're banned from going to school. Finally, we must build a global movement against gender apartheid. Student groups, feminist campaigners, religious leaders, and other human rights activists have a big role to play in building public pressure. As the South African scholar Penny Andrews told me in a recent conversation, student activism was the heartbeat of the anti-apartheid movement. I was reminded of it on my visit to the Apartheid Museum this week, when I saw the images of the 1976 Soweto uprising. It was in response to that brutality that young people around the world spoke out in solidarity with their fellow students to pressure individuals and institutions to take action. Now, as then, Students and activists everywhere must spread the word about atrocities happening in Afghanistan and make this cause their own. It took a bullet to my head for the world to stand with me. What will it take for the world to stand with the girls and women of Afghanistan. To anyone who says they care about protecting girls and women, to anyone who says they care about education, to anyone who says they care about oppression, what are you waiting for? The case could not be clearer. Right now, millions of Afghan girls are effectively imprisoned but they fight on, calling for justice, calling for the world to stand with them. They are the heroes the history books can teach us about. We must be their champions until they're free. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the 21st Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture Speaker, Ms. Malala Yousafzai. Thank you for what has undoubtedly been a very evocative and powerful clarion call for us not to look away, for us to cast our eyes firmly on what's happening in Afghanistan and for the global community to play its role in ensuring that gender apartheid is declared a crime against humanity. We promise, Malala, we will not look away again. Thank you so much.
As I indicated in the beginning, our speaker wishes to take the conversation further. We're delighted with this approach, Malala, and thank you so much for suggesting it to us. Allow me now to introduce the esteemed panel that is going to take the conversation further, led and moderated by our speaker. Our first panelist scarcely needs introduction. Mam Grasa Michelle is the founder of the Grasa Michelle Trust. She's a leading African stateswoman and renowned global leader whose decades-long professional and public life is rooted in the struggle for freedom and justice with a particular focus on Southern Africa, but globally as well, and her work in international advocacy for women and children's rights. Mam Grasa Michelle, please give a warm round of applause. Allow me now to introduce our other speakers who've traveled far to be here with us today. Metra Mehran is an Afghan human rights activist and academic whose work is focused on women's empowerment, gender equality, peace, and development. Please give a warm welcome to Metra Mehran. We're also delighted this afternoon to welcome Karima Benun. She's a professor of law at the University of Michigan. She specializes in public international law and international human rights law, but has had a particular focus over the past few years addressing the UN Security Council about gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Please welcome Karima Benun. Our final panelists this afternoon, Nombendulom Mkachwa is the youngest woman on the benches of the ANC in the National Assembly of the South African Parliament. She serves as the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Higher Education, Science and Technology. She's also, of course, as we know, a highly regarded activist and advocate for access to education. Please give a warm round of applause for Nombendulom Mkachwa. Thank you so much to everyone for your time today. And I would like to give a special thanks to all the speakers on the stage for agreeing to speak more about the topics I touched. I think it's really critical that we ground any conversation about Afghanistan by first hearing from an Afghan woman. Mitra, I'm hoping you can paint a picture for all of us. What life looked like growing up in Afghanistan and what life looks like right now for women in Afghanistan. Um, thank you so much. Uh, first, um, I am filled with gratitude sitting with you, an incredible woman, um, here um, gathering for our cause to leverage this prestigious space in a stage um, to shine light on atrocities in Afghanistan and gender apartheid in Afghanistan. And it is such a humbling experience um, to echo on visions of Nelson Mandela to talk about gender apartheid in my own country. Um, to give some context, let me take you back to 14th of August 2021, a day before Taliban's takeover. I woke up, walk on the same street of our shared home with millions of girls going to school and hundreds of thousands of women going to university and work. I went to work. After work, I went to my friends that we worked on Feminine Perspectives campaign to amplify voices of women in the peace negotiation processes. Um, just a normal day, a normal human being. But life was not, not that easy. My life was, my name was on a list, number six on that list, to be killed by the Taliban who so did name of many of my friends. I woke up every day um, listening and hearing about death of my friends, my colleagues, and the people I knew and admired. Taliban attacked our house where I lost two family members, 
And on another attack, they killed my cousin, whom I share so many cherished memories. Every day when, I, when we got out of our house, we were not sure if we are getting back home in the evening. Everyone was a target to the Taliban. But there was system, there was law that we had hope. And we were trying together, millions of women in Afghanistan, to take things forward. August, and no one was safe from the suicide bombs and explosions of the Taliban. August 15, the nightmare came true. Taliban take over Kabul and the government as a result of a negotiation process led by international community, mainly the United States government, and the people who are suffering the consequences in Afghanistan now, especially women, were not part of it. Now I'm sitting here in exile, and, and that same terrorist group is controlling Afghanistan. As you said too, if a woman is hungry, she cannot walk legally to a grocery store alone. If she is sick, she cannot go to a hospital to seek medical support. Because every single basic human rights is legally banned practicing it, that legally banned for women. Afghanistan is basically an open prison for everyone. And what's happening in Afghanistan, women bravely are resisting it. Women are on the streets, facing gunshots, arbitrary arrest, torture, and death. Many of those women were killed and their bodies were thrown on the street, so it worked as a deterrence to others. Yes, maybe violence is everywhere, but as I am talking here, Currently, Julia Parsi, I want to name them, Nida Parwani, Manija Siddiqui, Parisa Azada, Bahara Karimi, and countless other women that we do know about only because of protesting and resisting for their basic human rights are imprisoned. 16 of women who were imprisoned last year under torture, they were forced to give confession videos saying, me and two other women encouraged them to do the protest. Yes. They try to delegitimize their, their protest and resistance, but at the same time, they try to tie it with something from outside. Because for the Taliban and their misogynistic ideology, women's right is not universal. In that context, dignity and equality is exclusively defined for men. They thought these women can't be a local voice and ask for the basic um, uh, basic rights. And what makes it very different in context of Afghanistan is all these atrocities are happening systematically and institutionally. And it's enforced across the country by physical force against every single woman and girl in Afghanistan. And there is an office that oversees implementation of these 85 decrees you mentioned that limit and control women. Violating those, them, those decrees can lead to violence, imprisonment, torture, and even death. That's why they have as established a system corresponding to apartheid. And it should be recognized as what it is. And that should be criminalized in Afghanistan. As we have heard today, banning girls from school is a fundamental component of gender apartheid. Nompendulo, you fought to expand access to education. What is it about an educated girl that is so scary to men in power? Thank you so much, Malala, for that question. And greetings to everyone in the room. It's really an honor for me to be here with you all. And as we commemorate 10 years since the passing of Dr. Nelson Mandela, may his spirit continue to live on. Um, and thank you very much to the Nelson Mandela Foundation for reaching out to me to be part of a panel of such amazing women 
who on a day-to-day -day basis are leading for a just future in the various corners that they come from. Malala, I also want to thank you for sharing with us your story and to you too, Mitra. Um, when I started preparing for, for this engagement, I was so excited to be sharing this platform with yourself because of our commonly shared passion for education. You asked the question, what makes people so obsessed about education? I mean, when I think of our country, um, we, from the days of fighting for the liberation of our people, declared in the Freedom Charter that the doors of learning and teaching should be open to all. When you look at the UN and Article 26, it says that there should be access to education for all, that education is a human right. When you look at South, Africa, South Africa's government and its commitment to education through its budget, I mean, the biggest portion of the budget of the South African government goes towards education. I think it's about 460 billion rand. I don't know how to translate that to dollars, but we could do that later. But ultimately, in most countries, education is either used to empower or in the case of Afghanistan, it's being used as a tool to disempower. It's being used as a tool to divide. It's being used as a tool to create an inferior uh, portion or uh, uh, body of the country. This is not foreign. We've seen this in Nazi Germany. We've seen this in South Africa. Hendrik von Wurt created an act called Bantu Education, where it was ultimately aimed at ensuring that black women remained servants to white men and white people, that black men remained servants to big mining industries. Our fathers were stuck underground for hours and hours mining gold that they, they themselves could never ever buy for themselves. And that was intentional. It was intentional to ensure that black people are not actively participating in the economy, that black people are not leading society. I mean, he says that he, he didn't want to see greener pastures for us. That's exactly what I'm learning to understand is what is happening in Afghanistan. And so that is what makes education um, so powerful, not only to ensure the active participation of communities, right, through skills and knowledge, but also education helps you to shape and harness the thinking of communities, right? It, it helps you to... To, to teach communities what is right from wrong. It helps you to instill values and morals within communities that should be aligned to um, equality, that should be aligned to equity, to justice, to peace. That is what we should be teaching in our education system. Not what Hitler taught, where he was teaching people that they are more superior, they're an Aryan race to others. Not what is happening in Afghanistan, where women are being made to feel that they are lesser human beings. And that brings me to the why, for example, in our years of the student, of my, well, my years of student activism, um, why we had such a great focus on access to education, not only for, for all, but with a particular focus on women, on young women. In South Africa, Malala, we appreciate that under the apartheid regime, we, held, we had triple oppression, right? Where there was oppression along the lines of race, of class, and of gender. And today, as young black South African women, when we acknowledge the challenges we experience, we acknowledge them as a young black working class woman. So the age element makes it, I don't know what, quadruple oppression? That's what we experience. And so we've had to be very intentional about the type of policies we put in place that can protect young women. We fought for free education, and today, young people who come from households with an income bracket of 350,000 rand and below, and I did check how much that is in dollars, uh, I think it's about $19,000. So young people who come from those income brackets get to go to school or tertiary for free in South Africa. And that's been intentional. It's been intentional that we say young girls in schools must have sanitary dignity, so they must have sanitary towels. We've been intentional to say the Department of Social Development in South Africa must cater for households that are led by children and must support them because out of the five children in the household, if four are boys and one is a girl, the one who's going to have to sacrifice going to school is most probably going to be the girl child. 
So in order for us to see women participate in the economy, become leaders of society, we've had to be intentional about their inclusion in education as that has a ripple effect into their participation in the economy and society. Fully agree on that. Education is powerful and uh, in order to ensure that we keep challenging patriarchy, we have to invest in women and girls education. Now I would uh, discuss more gender apartheid as a concept, as a law. I'm not um, a lawyer, but I am an activist, so it would be good to talk about gender apartheid to a legal expert and I would love to talk to Karima on this because she is the legal expert that we're looking for here. Why is it important to codify gender apartheid? Thank you so much for this question, Malala, and for your support for Afghan women who are leading the global call for the recognition of gender apartheid. And I have to say that it's very humbling to be on this stage. It's very humbling to be discussing apartheid before an audience that knows better than anyone in the world what that means and just how difficult it is to challenge. And allow me also to say personally, as the granddaughter of an Algerian peasant leader who was killed by colonial forces while taking part in Algeria's liberation struggle, that it is a profound honor to be at this event honoring Madiba's legacy. And this really brings me back to your question, Malala, because I see the same courage and commitment my Algerian grandfather showed fighting colonialism in the fight by Afghan women today against unjust Taliban rule. The good news is that many UN officials and experts have correctly condemned the grave violations that Mitra so eloquently described as gender apartheid, including the UN Secretary General himself. The UN Special Rapporteur on Afghanistan has also used this term, called on the world to end it, and explained that it is an institutionalized system of discrimination, segregation, humiliation, and exclusion of women and girls. Countries, governments from many regions have joined this call. And I'm glad to say, and I say with tremendous gratitude, that South Africa did this in the UN Human Rights Council in June both recognizing that the situation in Afghanistan constitutes gender apartheid, but also calling on the world to take effective steps to end it, akin to those steps taken to help end de jure apartheid in South Africa. This was a landmark act of human rights leadership, and we have to call on the international community to heed those words, to go beyond condemnation, and take concerted effective action to end this systematic oppression. What has been tried since the Taliban took power isn't working. And I think, along with many Afghan women, I believe that gender apartheid is one of the most promising options for a way forward. So what does that mean legally? What are the consequences of using the apartheid framing in this context? Well, adapted from the international law on racial apartheid, Gender apartheid emphasizes that discrimination has actually become the system of government. It's the entire aim of governance. The apartheid framework then tells us that the ordinary human rights approach that really expects the state to lead on human rights issues can't work here. The only way positive change can happen is with a consistent and principled international response. So one of the most powerful aspects of the apartheid framework is that it clarifies the legal obligations of other states to take effective action to end this illegal situation. And I must say that South Africans know better than anyone else in the world the abject moral failure that so-called constructive engagement with apartheid represents. This is what Afghan women like Mitra and her colleagues are watching in horror now increasing attempts by some international actors to normalize the Taliban despite their repressive policies, while Afghan women continue to risk their lives to demand equality. That should really outrage us. That is not acceptable. And so a gender apartheid approach would mean, as was the case with racial apartheid in South Africa, that it is not legal for any state to be complicit with the Taliban's illegal actions. 
There can be no recognition of the Taliban, at least until they end their system of gender apartheid. To end, let me say this month is very special, both because of the sad anniversary today and also because of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Afghan women are the bravest defenders of the Declaration's principles, including equality, some of the bravest in the world. So now is an essential time, not next year, not some other time, now is an essential time to stand with them by ending gender apartheid. It is a time to fulfill Madiba's prophecy, a powerful statement that he made on the day he left prison, when he said, apartheid has no future. Now it is up to all of us to make sure that prophecy comes true. Karima, I would just like to quickly follow up. What would the process look like for getting this done? Who so, would need to take action and, and who could potentially be standing in the way? I became a human rights lawyer because I believe that international law can be a critical tool for achieving social justice, for supporting frontline human rights movements. But that's only possible if we have the international law we actually need. And I agree here with the executive director of UN Women, who is Seema Bahus of Jordan, who recently told the Security Council that the tools the international community has at its disposal were not created to respond to mass systemic gender oppression. Uh, and she's really calling us to name and prescribe in our global norms, specifically the kind of abuses, the systematic abuses perpetrated by the Taliban so that we can respond appropriately. And I very much agree with this. So there are two key tracks we need to work along to make this happen, to make sure we have the international law we need to support Mitra and her colleagues. The first is to use the apartheid law that we inherited from the 20th century, and to do that with a gender-inclusive interpretation appropriate to the 21st century. So we interpret that law to include gender apartheid. We say that the spirit of that law applies also to this kind of apartheid. And I can say as a professor of international law, this is how international law evolves. This is similar to how the prohibition of violence against women first came to be recognized in human rights law. It was interpreted to be included in that law by the UN CEDAW committee, which targets and tackles discrimination against women. So we can go forward now in support of Afghan women by carefully applying existing international apartheid law to challenge the Taliban and also those who are complicit with them, as you so eloquently reminded us. We have to remember that Madiba said that freedom is indivisible. We must tackle this kind of apartheid too. And that brings me to the second track of action we need to take here in the legal field. You are quite right when you said that we have to push hard for codification of the prohibition of gender apartheid. That is explicit recognition of this concept in international law. And at the moment, there is a pressing opportunity to do this, given that the UN is considering the draft convention on crimes against humanity. And so I very humbly call on South Africa, which is uniquely positioned in this debate, to raise this issue with the UN General Assembly in April during the sixth committee session, which will discuss the convention. I hope that South African human rights advocates will encourage and support their government in playing this leadership role, and that civil society around the world will encourage their governments to stand with South Africa in this. As the theme of the event reminds us, the time to lead for a just future is now. States, and indeed all of us, should be as courageous as Afghan women on the front lines protesting for their rights. And let me end by answering the question you asked me about who might oppose us in this legal journey. There are many who support us, like you, like Mom Grasa. That is very encouraging. Uh, but among those who might oppose us are, I'm afraid, some people in my field of international law who are afraid of inter innovation in that field, who want to simply preserve the law as it was, even if it is continuing to fail women. I'm not willing to accept that, and I know that you aren't either. 
And so to those people, I would say, the vital framework on racial apartheid law didn't exist either until states in the global south realized, faced with the atrocities in southern Africa, that that law was essential. And they expended political capital to make sure it was codified. And that is exactly what we need to do today, even though the times are very different. And I remember in closing that Madiba said that when people are determined, they can overcome anything. So let's come together and again prove him right. Mongrasa, you have been an early champion for this cause. What was it that you saw that convinced you that the Taliban was doing a kind of apartheid? Thank you, Malala, for this question. Hello, South Africans. I must start by saying today it's not a good day for me to be speaking. It is particularly hard, so please bear with me. It's a, it's a kind of instinct. What speaks to you deeply as a human being? Your sense of what is right, what is wrong. You don't need to think hard to feel it and of course to express it. You see, we have been millions of us as uh, women's rights activists as uh, educationists, we have been for too long engaged in this, that it's, uh, it's absolutely unbearable for you to understand and to live with it, that someone because he is a male and he is in power, can simply wake up and decide 52% of the population of this country, which in this case is Afghanistan, do not have rights. It, it's, it's very hard for us to take it. Although we have been facing discrimination and violations of our rights, but it's very hard to live with the fact that in 2023, we will be taken back to what we had believed, that it's a never again. And when the United Nations established that specific unit within its structures, really to work daily on how to dismantle apartheid in South Africa, because apartheid has no place in modern times. So, we believe that uh, with the promise of uh, 94 here, it was really a never again for South Africa, but it was never again for the rest of human family. It wouldn't cross our mind that it could be made a legal system, a system of governance, which filter into all aspects of life, 
political, economic, social, cultural, religious, to make it a decree that we women don't count. I mean, it's, it's, it was very easy for me to feel a sense of revolt to say, it takes me back to those days because I'm a black woman. I had been told that I do not exist, I don't count. And now, simply because millions of human beings in Afghanistan, they happen to be female, they are not recognized as citizens of that country. So when I say it was instinct, it's because we believe in the things we have been working on. And we really had believed also in the promise that it is a never again for anyone across the globe that apartheid could not become again part of any system of governance. So here we are. And I think we have to thank you, Malala. And we have to thank you, Mira, for coming the two of you, to bring these reflections home to us. Because, you know, African sand is a little bit far geographically. And we become overwhelmed with our own challenges here. And then we wake up working and forgetting, if we can forget, forgetting that the young they are those millions of our sisters who are living the agony of what we have gone through and we were victorious. So you are asking why and how did it take me there? It would have happened to any South African woman here. It's not me alone. I don't have to be an exception on this. What is happening is these South Africans who gave a lesson to the world of how to organize, how to mobilize, and how to get it in the table, on the table of every single powerful person in the world to say apartheid has to be dismantled. Now, you can and say, uh-uh, you have to do the same. As you did for South Africa, you have to do it for Afghanistan. And it's for, particularly, for women of Afghanistan. But this is an affront to all women in the world, by the way. This is an affront for all of us. Because, you know, we live with the gender-based violence, which is everywhere in any country in the world. And we think, oh, it's okay, it is, we try to find some kind of justifications. But you know, this, what is happening in that country, don't fool ourselves. Other countries can copy this and make it a legal system, a system of governance to say the horrors of gender-based violence which we are living with can be transformed on a system of uh, governance against women. Because we have to be clear, it's against women. So we, 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 we have to take this. We have to take this feeling that, no, it's not so far as we might have thought. It is here. It is our own issue. And again, because we have the experience of how to organize and to mobilize, perhaps this is what we can share with you and to see how now we take it up. But this is to thank you for having come and brought it home thank you. to us that we have to raise up and raise the bar, raise the bar of how we fight for women's rights globally, because that is an experiment which can be transferred to any other country. Nita, 
for someone fighting injustices happening in real time, does the legal approach feel like it's taking too long? And how do you see uh, this effort helping girls today and future generations of women's rights activists around the world? Thank you. We, we need that, that voice, that strength, and that rage um, from everyone and everyone. Um, to put that in context, I think, let me quote someone. Before coming here, I talked with a um, few groups of uh, girls who are not allowed to go to school and university anymore. And I received a message, a WhatsApp message, after one of my calls, um, a girl named Brushno, 13 years old. Um, she had written me, she says, and I quote, I feel annihilated and worthless. I am afraid of wishing because I feel everything worthy in my life is gone. And today is day 806, almost two and a half years that girls cannot go to school in Afghanistan anymore. And I ask myself, what's happening to the humanity, to the civilization we have built in 21st century? We have failed her. She cannot even make a wish or have a dream for herself because she thinks everything worthy in her life is taken from her. Brushna deserves better, but we also can do better. And I think as a world, as an international community, we shouldn't allow anyone to do these practices and remain without consequences and punishment. Each passing day, 806 day today from 15th of August 2021, sits a trajectory that will take us decades to reverse. Those women are never, most of them, a large number of them, never gonna come back to school because they, they are victim of forced marriages. Many of them think of suicide now. And I don't know, God knows what happens to them. And when we talk about the law and taking time, for me is, what is the law? It is the will of the people. And if we don't leverage it and we don't utilize it to someone in another part of the world, what is it for? And I think the awful human rights and women's rights situation in Afghanistan should draw that rage and action from the global community to fasten that legal processes. So they be responsive to the atrocities happening in Afghanistan. And also approaching from a moral point, which Michelle Grossa, um, Madam, raised yesterday, uh, in, in, and I was impressed saying, this shouldn't be even a matter of debate in the rooms of international law. Why we hesitate when we are talking about the very basic human rights of women millions of them in that part of the world. So for me is the approaches, the legal approaches, um, Professor Karima mentioned, we need to codify, and I call on everyone, for the codification of gender apartheid as a crime against humanity. And for that, which April, we are the UN Legal Committee uh, is going to meet, is a very good opportunity for us, but we don't have much time. So I urge everyone that we mobilize political and social support necessary for that. The second thing is, as I am sitting here, and I'm humbled, that I want and call South African government to persist on their leadership and making sure other countries come on board to codify and criminalize gender apartheid in Afghanistan. And I think most important thing is, if apartheid convention is already there, why we need to wait many years to create a very new law? It's there. Taliban in Afghanistan are committing it. We just need to add the word gender next to race and apply it for the context of Afghanistan and anywhere in the world that's applicable. Because we need to remember Atrocities happening in Afghanistan 
is not going to remain there. It's going to cross those boundaries. And I think that law is for the safeguard of the girls and women in Afghanistan now, but it's also a promise and a message to our future. A future where dignity of a woman and a girl is respected and protected everywhere in the world. And I want to conclude by saying that what's happening in Afghanistan, if a woman is not dressed properly, the man is authorized to control her by law. The man is authorized to control her if she can go to groceries or she cannot. What if she is hungry, right? Or she can receive aid. That system is institutionally want to maintain the dominance of men over women. What exactly happened here? And I think this is the perfect place to start that conversation in Kuwait globally. I also want to touch on the collective work that it will take to move this forward. So um, I thought I could ask Nam Pendulo. Um, you have been fighting for the legacies of apartheid from your student days to now as a member of parliament. What would you say to activists? Um, and what would you say to politicians about their role in championing this cause? Thank you very much, Malala, for that question. And I want to state to yourself and to Mitra that as of now, I want to commit myself, I am pledging my commitment to this room and to yourselves that I will be a voice for... Thank you. Thank you. For women and girls in Afghanistan against the injustices and the atrocities that they face, I believe that in order to galvanize communities and mobilize communities in the spirit of international solidarity, people must know what's going on. And today, we're doing that in South Africa. People, South Africans today will know. It's not only us who are in the room here. People are watching live on various um, uh, platforms. And whichever corner that we find ourselves in, as many of us here who are leaders of various spaces, I see, um, Mom Ellen Osisulu, we serve together on the Ahmed Kathrada uh, Foundation Board of Trustees. I see Minister Zizigotwa, and there are many young people. And I've got my volunteers from Wits University. They lead various student organizations. They're in the room. Each organization, uh, well, most if they are progressive, should have a portfolio called International uh, um, Affairs. Those portfolios in these student organizations, in these departments, in these various spaces should from today take a commitment to raise the voices of young girls and women in Afghanistan. And I must say it's, it's, it's really been something I've had to reflect on since, well, for, for days now, but even more so yesterday that whilst the whole, I mean, the space I've been familiar to is the space of gender activism and fighting for gender equity. I sat on the presidential gender um, review committee appointed by President Ramaphosa. Uh, I had the honor of going to, you know, CSW 63. And in my mind, we're all talking about increased inclusion for women, intersectionality, gender equity. And one assumes that's the language of the world. And so one is shocked. Okay, of course we know there's, the, there's, there's, there's microaggression in terms of you know, patriarchy and sexism and chauvinism, but to actually legalize it, I think for me, it's something that we absolutely cannot allow as global citizens. And so that's also been something that I've had to, to reflect on. And I just wanted to go back a bit, Malala, because I got inspired by what Mitra and Mamkrasa said. But I, quickly answer your question because they deliberately put that timer for us um, after realizing in the briefing yesterday how much we all talk they said we need to put a timer there for them um, so I'm yes. going to take one minute Nompendulo moving from the picket lines to parliament 
it feels the same. It's just that the chief whip would really hit me if I arrived in tackies like I would on the picket lines. Now I must arrive in heels or something more formal. But beyond that, it's the same. You continue to fight for inclusion, but I've also learned to be deliberate. I've learned to look at the annual performance plans of the department I hold to account to see where the inclusion of women is. Because just talking about it, it's not good enough. We need to see the intentional targeting for women to be supported for the commercialization of innovations. How many women were supported for that? Why can't you, why can't you target bit higher? Because you know? sometimes the targets are really low. They're not in proportion to gender representation in the country. So you ask yourself, why can't it be aligned to, to the number of women in the country? You ask those deliberate questions. You ask where the money, the budgeting is for the intersectionality that we want to see, for the gender representation that we want to see, because we will not live in a society that makes us feel as though we are uh, uh, invisible as, as women. And so we need to be deliberate. We need to be deliberate and in, intentional about how we ensure the inclusion of women from the picket lines right through to parliament. And, and Malala, sorry. There's nothing I've appreciated more now. You know, young people thought that when we go to parliament, we're going to solve all the problems. There's nothing I appreciate like young people mobilizing and galvanizing to affirm that of which we are fighting for in those chambers that can be really intimidating and difficult for young women to exist within. Thank you. So moving back to Mitra, because keeping Afghan girls and women centered in any campaign is vital, what practical things can people watching do to support activists like you? Thank you so much. Um, I think I am in awe of bravery of the women in Afghanistan protesting Taliban on the streets facing gunshots and lashes and paper sprays and imprisonment and torture. Their voice is there. We need the people to educate themselves, understand and fathom the depth of atrocities happening in Afghanistan and amplify those voices from inside. Listen to those people. And with that, what we do is recognize their political agency. Because countries around the world, and even international legal system, and, and any other states that are engaging with Taliban, politically, they think there is no alternative for the Taliban in Afghanistan. And they think maybe women's protesting are only asking about women's rights. Everyone is neglecting the political agency of women. By recognizing them, them we empower them too. We need to be, make sure that they are hurt, first thing. The second thing, they are suffering so much, struggling. When I talk to them and talk about the risks, I remember many of them saying, there is nothing left to lose, Mitra. But still, they are, they, they are there. And if we are comfortable, at least physically safe, we all sh have moral responsibility to ask what we can do for them. And they give you clear demands how you can help. The second thing is, figures like you, Madam, international experts like Karima, Parliament members and activists, we need an international mobilization from everyone like you to equal the problems there, to say why it is necessary. We need that solidarity that is missing. So thank you for leveraging this platform for that. And I use, from this platform, I call everyone. Because as I said before, law is well of the people. If we all are mobilized globally, lawyers and legal system have to respond to us. They will. We just need to know our own power. And I think for the people in audience or international donors and organizations that are hearing me uh, is the system and the governance of the terrorist Taliban regime in Afghanistan 
have removed people from all spaces, economics, social, and political. So it's up to us now to ensure that local NGOs lead by women are funded, that they can continue their fight even if it's underground, because many of them are resisting. Some of them are on the street, but many of them are running closed door schools. They are supporting with health services and other uh, things. So these are the things I think we can do in addition that the legal means that I mentioned before. I'm glad that we have spent um, the last 45 minutes or so focused on Afghanistan. But as I mentioned in my speech, there are many crises in the world today. So I want to give us some time to talk about Palestine. I'm heartbroken for the children and family in Gaza. The scale of devastation is unimaginable, and the need for a permanent ceasefire is long overdue. Mamgrasa, I would love to know your perspective on what we are seeing unfold. And perhaps you could share some of your experiences about how to bridge divides that seem insurmountable. Uh, perhaps before I, I respond directly to your question, I would uh, like to take this opportunity to stress uh, a point which uh, I believe is very important. It is important to follow the legal, the legal perspective and to argue in legal terms. Because yes, it has been legalized. But it's also equally important to look at the morality side of it. And why I'm saying this we can, we can be embroiled in terms of how do we argue, or how do we have the international law and says, etc., etc. Listen, the more that system consolidates itself, the more it will be extremely difficult to eradicate it. And the experience tells us that when you go the legal way only, Oh, there are experts who are very good in keep you entertaining and discussing, and you'll spend decades trying to explain what is gender apartheid and how it expresses itself and which organ should be. You will be entertained with this. My point is, the experience we have, we have had in this country is that yes, 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 institutions had to do its work. But the most powerful, the most powerful tool which made the apartheid fall here, it was social mobilization. Let us say it is morally, it's morally impossible to explain how you establish a system which will discriminate against women. We know that we are being discriminated socially. We fight for that discrimination. We try to make governments to be much more responsive. But it, let us be clear, this is an elevation of the social issue which is transformed into a system of governance which is going to come and fall on us on top of what we are suffering. So the point I want to make here, let us stand and say, uh-uh, the, the sooner that system is eradicated in Afghanistan, the better for all of us, because no one will be attempted, I mean, to elevate it, to make it legal. This is one. The second one, as I said, it will take decades until we get it to the legal system. But the voice of the people, organized, and really taking it to the table of each powerful person, but more importantly, making I don't know how many thousands, if not millions, of organizations in this continent 
and other continents in I mean, uh, Asia and uh, Latin America, and even in Europe. All organizations working in education. If we put this issue, this girls in Afghanistan have the right for education, and this has to be dismantled now. One, women's rights. Women to be prevented of getting out, going to shops, going to school, going to health. This has to be stopped now. You don't need a law. Morally, you cannot accept that this consolidates this regime. And that's my point. Is that yes, let's go the legal one, but more importantly, make of all organizations which are working in, uh, in education. Make of all organizations which are working in health, all organizations working in women's rights, all organizations in fact working in human rights in general, to stand and say, this has to stop and it is now. Don't give it a life. Don't give it a right. Don't give it a right to have a life. I want to also to emphasize another point. You know, this thing of, uh, I have very, in, in my life I have met very good, very good men. But I also, I have, I have met millions of men who believe that they have a right over women's lives, even over women's bodies. It is exactly the same kind of issue we are talking about. We say it's in Afghanistan. We have to make it clear, strong and loud. And we are here in 16 days of activism, right? Let's be very precise. This thing of men thinking that they have a right over the lives of women, this thing of them believing that they have a right over the bodies of it has to stop now. Don't give it a time. Don't give it a time. Because the more we give it a time, it's like we tolerate what is intolerable and we justify what is unjustifiable. And this is the moral issue I'm raising. And with this, really, it is now. In fact, in the case of Af it shouldn't even have happened. It shouldn't have happened. So you can't take the strategy of trying to work on it as if it's something which has a right to exist. That's the first point. Now you are asking about bridges. You know? It is that uh, high caliber of leadership which we got from that uh, generation of leaders which this country, not only South Africa, but this region, Southern Africa, we had in that generation the, 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 the high spirit which was able to see in all of us the superiority of our dignity over anything which makes this different. So it's not like, how do I do it? I think we shall just have to go back to those lessons. And the lessons which allowed us to have that ground in where all have a sense of belonging. We all felt we belonged to a certain space. We all felt that we had a common responsibility because it was a common space for all of us. It is, I have to say to South Africans now, it is in our DNA. So it's not a question of how, how do I see it happen. It's, it's simply how do we revive that. Solidarity and identifying the humanity in the other person, it was given a political meaning, but coming exactly to what it was Desmond Tutu who reminded about Ubuntu, right? And so I think we have been embroiled in these things of uh, I, huh? instead of we. 
as, as Africans, we always think we. We greet one another, we ask, how are you? Minjani. No, nobody asks you, you as individual. They ask in collective, in plural. That is the plural which is our philosophy of life as Africans. That's what helps us. And we will not only have to revive it for ourselves, but it's exactly to look at you and say, so what? It just happens that we are born in Pakistan. It just happens that you were born in Afghanistan. But you are me and me are you. And they take up then the struggles of all of us as indivisible. I think it's possible to do this. Because as I'm saying, it has been the way we held hands with one another. What is preventing us now to hold hands with one another? What is it? Can you respond? What is it? So the bridges we are talking about, they are psychological bridges. We are allowing them to consolidate in our thinking. But we need to be dismantling as well those psychological walls which we are allowing to separate us from one another. And I want to finalize, I hope you are not going to ask much more questions, is to say, you know, you put it right, darling. We are going to, to sit down, a group of us, and say, what, is, what it means to revive the sense of collective responsibility, reconnecting with one another, Yes, it is because we have a task you have brought to us. But it is really to take us back to be who we are as a South African society and who we are as African societies and African societies which are connected to other societies across the group and we do not know what is the difference of a human dig dignity. Human dignity is human dignity everywhere. It is our business. So, I'll follow Mom Grasa's instructions. I cannot ask more questions. I want to thank each one of you for your insights today. Today we are here in the spirit of students. We are learning, we are discussing, and we are saying facts and we are saying truth. So, I want to thank you all for your time and I'd want to tell everybody who's watching this, stand up with Afghan girls and Afghan women. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Metra Mahran Karima Benun Nombendulom Kachwa, Mam Grasa Michelle, and ably led in a fiery and informative and insightful discussion by our 21st Nelson Mandela annual lecture speaker, Malala Yousafzai. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, allow me to call on the acting CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Professor Vern Harris, for the closing remarks. Uh, hi, everybody. Mine will be very short. It's hard to follow and act like that. Let me just say a few words of reflection before I offer 
thanks to the many people who have made today possible. I think what we've been hearing today is that humanity's long walks to freedom seem never to end. And of course, in principle, freedom is never something that a society, whatever the context, a society can claim to have. Freedom means something only when you're working at it. You're growing it. You're including more people. And so the work never ends. And I think Madiba told us this, and we didn't really hear it so well. But this work can be exhausting. And for me today, offered us one of those key things. When you're doing this exhausting work, you need inspiration to keep going. And the foundation, and I speak personally as well, gratitude to Malala for being uh, a figure, a voice that keeps inspiring us and also gives us wisdom. We need these qualities as we continue struggling for that just society that Madima dreamed of. I want to thank um, Malala's team, uh, the Malala Fund, uh, members of her family who traveled with her, Asr Ziadin, Nikiwe, our program director, of course the panel, and then a special thanks to, to Mrs. Michelle, um, not as a panelist, uh, but Mum has been on the stage of the annual lecture every single year since it started. And, yeah. And she did take some persuading to be such an active part. And told us that this will be the last time she speaks on the stage of the annual lecture. That also makes this lecture significant for me. Then I want to thank our sponsors, and um, in no particular order. It's been uh, humbling to see so many come forward and tell us that they want to continue supporting this platform. wreck -It, Old Mutual, PepsiCo, Brand South Africa, Vodacom, Uber, YFM, Mail and Garden, Guardian, sorry, Mercedes, MSC, and then Vision Tactical, who have provided security services uh, pro bono. We value that support. Black Motion Productions for the production here today. Very grateful. We're grateful to Durko and the Presidency for enabling all the visas that we had to get. Although one longs for the day when routine processes work. Uh, we're grateful to the Johannesburg Theatre. It's fantastic to come back here after 20 years. Uh, all my colleagues, um, great team, and we've, we've been through a rough year at the foundation. We've pulled together something that feels special, it feels fresh, and that group of people have done an amazing job. Thank you so much. <laughs> Last but not least, you, the audience, uh, both those of you here, and those of you watching um, from some distance, it's, it's the support you continue to give us that enables us to keep mobilizing Madiba's legacy uh, for these continuing struggles for justice. So thank you very much. And what I'm going to do now is invite onto the stage Yolanda. I think we're breaking records with young people on this Nelson Mandela annual lecture stage. She's going to provide a bit of entertainment, uh, which you're welcome to enjoy as you begin to make your way home. Thank you so much, Yolanda.
Picture One picture in the end, okay? Picture, picture in the new land.